Hi, I'm Tim Deegan. I recently managed to finally destroy the spoil board, which some people call a waste board, of my X-Carb CNC. Now, router-based CNCs typically work in wood, and generally, any operation you're gonna perform on the workpiece that is gonna pass through the workpiece and cut below it, you want to avoid cutting into the deck. And even though this deck is sold as a spoil board or waste board, it's got these lovely threaded inserts through these holes for clamping that I don't particularly want to trash. Now I've drilled through my spoil boards before and I've done some damage to this deck, but it's in good shape for the most part. Nevertheless, I want to put a new spoil board on top of it and all the work pieces I put on top of that. Now a spoil board in this sense could be very simple. It could be nothing more than a piece of scrap wood clamped underneath your workpiece to allow you to drill through or mill through or whatever you're going to do. Um, I like to use a more reusable spoil board and the kind I like to build have a variety of things on them. They have not only the holes drilled through so I can continue to use the existing threaded inserted holes. They also, it's also leveled so that it's true to the axes of the machine. And I engrave 10 millimeter lines on it that have been engraved by the machine so I know they're true to the axes as well. So there are three separate operations that get undertaken when I make a spoil board. And I thought I'd share this with you. Now I've already made this one up and I did some videos of time lapses. So I'm really gonna talk to the various steps involved in what I'm making here. First off, let's talk about drilling. Now usually when you wanna talk about drilling, you're talking about using a drill bit. It's a tool bit designed for cutting through, straight through things. In this case, however, I really want to be able to use a countersink uh, screw to be able to center the hole as I screw this into the board. Um, and I want that head to be far enough down so that when I am using the spoil board to you know, take extra penetration on a bit. I don't actually hit this, so it needs to be pretty far down. So in this case, I'm actually using a countersink bit, which is in routing terms usually referred to as a V-carving bit for the operation, the two and a half D operation of V-carving. But in this case, really what I'm gonna do is drill with the V-carving bit just deep enough so that it penetrates just enough that the hole it makes in the bottom is five millimeters wide. Now the hole I'm trying to make to is 6.75 millimeters wide. And what this does is let me sort of focus the screws centered in that hole and it leaves the shoulders to hold the countersink edges. We'll look a little closer at how I knew just how far to drill this so that it got to the right depth and made the right set of holes. One of the nice things about the Inventables XCAR table that I'm using is that Inventables publishes CAD drawings for all the various parts. This is the CAD drawing for the spoil board deck that comes with the system, and it provides some really useful information. Uh, um, among the things that it provides that are super helpful to have is absolute clarity over what the dimensions of the pass-through holes with their threaded inserts are. They're 6.75 millimeters through, they're 12.75 millimeters at the bottom with a countersink uh, where the threaded insert is kept. Uh, this also gives you the distance between each of the various holes, their XY position from a zero origin, which makes it easy to calculate if you're trying to create a spoil board with this matching hole pattern where it needs to go. This is the Fusion 360 sketch that I use to calculate how far down from the top of the MDF board I needed to drill my V-carve bit to achieve the size hole I wanted at the bottom with the proper countersink. So this solid blue area represents the profile with accurate dimensions of the V-carve bit. This line and these lines at the bottom represent the distance between the top and the bottom of the MDF board, which is 12.8 millimeters. 
I want to leave a five millimeter hole at the bottom where the bit pierces through the MDF. To achieve that, I've got to take the bit 2.505 millimeters below the bottom of the board for a total of 15.305 millimeters from the top of the board. Now, five millimeter hole at the bottom of the board is less than the 6.75 millimeter holes that are in the board I'm mating it to. So you might ask, why not keep going and make a perfect match of 6.75 millimeters? And the answer is that I really want to get these little triangles of MDF left. I mean, if you've ever worked with MDF, you know that in thin layers, it's pretty brittle. And my intent is that once I end up pushing the screws or the threaded rods through the hole down into this, they're going to break loose those little triangles very easily. And when they sit in the countersink, that'll form a little shaft beyond the countersink they go through so that they're kind of self-centered on one hand and you know nicely positioned with the countersink on the other side. So 15.305 millimeters is my magic number and I can go ahead and set that up in my G-code. The pattern of holes that I want to create on the spoil board is an 8x8 array. Uh, I tend to go to big box stores and buy the 24 inch by 24 inch pieces of MDF that are readily available. Sometimes I'll buy a big sheet and rip it down, but it's surprising how often the smaller sheets go on sale. I want to center the holes, and that means using a 42 millimeter by 42 millimeter uh, border around them. So the first hole is going to be at 42, 42. Uh, the holes are 75 millimeters apart in both directions. So once I've gotten a clear picture, which I use Fusion 364 to visualize what I want to do, it's a pretty repetitive drilling operation. Uh, and drilling is such a simple CNC act of uh, moving to a position and moving the Z axis up and down that I actually don't generate the tool path for something like this, typically in Fusion or, or Vectric or uh, easel or things like that. I, I tend to do it in a spreadsheet. Now, as a note, for this operation, the drilling, I am going to put a different spoil board, a piece of scrap wood underneath this, so that as I drill through, I'm not drilling through into the deck of the machine. But after that, I'll be actually screwing this spoil board that I made to the deck itself, and that'll really make it firm and flat. The surfacing operations, the engraving operations will then be done on it in the place that it needs to be. And if I have to take it off, because I've left these screw holes small enough and I use enough of them, it should center back up. Worst case, if it doesn't, I surface it again and I engrave it again. But the drilling is the first operation that positions the board and keeps it there because I don't take it off each time. I leave it in place for all the work I do. Now, I need a G-code toolpath to be able to control the machine. And I could use a variety of different mechanisms to generate that. I could use uh, Vectric, I could potentially use Fusion 360, I could potentially use Easel, there are a lot of them. But for repetitive operations like this that are very straightforward, um, I tend to just use Excel. <laughs> or Google Sheets in this case, which is free. And I generate my own toolpath uh, and let's take a little closer look at how I did that. I'm a big fan of Google Sheets. It's uh, available, it's free, it's easy to share, and it's easy to get no matter what computer I'm on. Uh, I create pretty simple spreadsheets. Really, it's a set of columns that I can put things into, and then one column that is a concatenation, a merging together of all the previous columns uh, with spaces in between them so that I can lay out the actual g-code I want and in this case I start off with a few simple g-codes that tell it that I'm working in metric and absolute positioning and a few things like that and then for each of the holes I have a block for each row that is so I'm going to g1 go to x 42 y 42 and set my speed uh, my feed speed at 1000 
Once I'm there, I'm going to take the Z axis and move it down to my targeted position and then move it back up. And then I'm going to move 42 millimeters in the X axis. I'm going to keep Y the same here. When I get to the end of that, I'm going to move up one set of 75 millimeters on the Y axis. This is part of that serpentine pattern and stay stable on Y and again, move backwards in the X axis. So I keep doing this. I've got blocks of G code representing each of the rows. And then I just copy and paste this into a simple notepad, notepad plus any kind of editor to make sure I look at it. But I can tell right now it's going to be just exactly what I need to drill that set of holes. I use Universal G Code Sender UGS to uh, send the G Code to my CNC tool. Um, but it's always helpful to use its visualizer if you're using the platform build as opposed to the classic build to be able to look and see is it going to actually look like what you think it should look like. So this is the G Code file that was created out of my Google Sheets, and you can see it goes to the 4242. It then goes down, it goes up, down, up, and it follows the serpentine pattern that I'm looking for until it gets to the end. So my G-code looks pretty good. I think we're all set up and ready to start the operations for the spoil board. There's really no substitute for a repetitive precision operation like using a CNC. Drilling these holes uh, by any method by hand would be not anywhere near as useful as this. I feel super confident that this is exactly the pattern I need at the spacing I want. With the drilling operation completed, I can remove the rough spoil board and actually go ahead and screw the new spoil board down to the deck for the two new operations I'm going to do, which are surfacing with the surfacing bit and engraving with an engraving bit. Let's look a little deeper at what's going to go on with surfacing. Surfacing bits are a little expensive, but they're really awesome. Um, they tend to have uh, indexed cutters, meaning that you can unscrew them and turn them and put them in a new solid position. Like if you take this little blade off of each side and turn it 90 degrees, you get to use another cutting surface. And because of the construction of the tool, it'll be aligned uh, correctly. These have an inch and a half. This is an Amana tool that has an inch and a half cutting radius, which is huge. And all kinds of interesting things happen. Uh, the first time I tried cutting at this, what I noticed was that I didn't have my dust boot aligned correctly. And the slight drag of the edge of the fringe on the dust boot was causing the whole head to tilt just a tiny bit. Now, I, it, it's a fraction of a degree, but on an inch and a half wide cutting radius, it actually makes a visible line. You can notice it. And I had to go back and resurface down a little bit to clean all that up after I readjusted the um, dust boot so that it wouldn't create any drag. I will also tell you that especially with MDF, doing a surfacing operation will generate phenomenal snow flurries. I've tried videotaping it in the past without the dust boots so you can see what's going on because it's a fun operation to watch. But it has created monstrous piles of dust that'll be in this shop for the next 30 years. Um, so at this point, I recommend always, always making sure that you use as much uh, vacuum and dust management as you can. In fact, you'll see in the time lapse, I had to open the garage doors because when I first tried this to keep the lighting the same, uh, it turned out that even with the dust collector working perfectly, the micro fines in the air were so much that I, even with the dust mass, was starting to get a headache. So ventilation in all operations is critical, but especially with MDF and any kind of surfacing operation, that's important. The construction of the G-code for the surfacing pass is pretty much the same as the drill in that it goes back and forth and back and forth. In this case, though, I really want to go left to right, then back across, and go left to right each pass. So I'm actually zigzagging. So it's kind of serpentine, kind of zigzagging. The distinction here is that what I'm going to do, I'm going to start at 20-20, okay? 
and then I'm going to go all the way across to 600Z. I picked 20 because an inch and a half diameter surfacing bit is a little over 38 millimeters. So I'm only going to move 20 millimeters at each pass, so I get a lot of overlap. Um, so I start at 20, I go to 2020 from wherever I've positioned the head first. And here, one of the things you'll notice is I don't have a Z move. And really what I want to do is zero the surfacing bit to the board and then make a gut check about how deep each pass is going to be. Um, I'm not positive how much I want to take off. I want to take off the least I can to level it to the axes, but I don't really want to take off any more because over time, you know, I'm going to dig into this board. Eventually, I'm going to want to resurface it. So I want to leave as much room as possible for resurfacing later. Um, so I'm going to take really thin passes. So I may run this whole set of G code more than once if I don't feel like I've gotten the whole thing cut clean each pass. The other thing I'm going to do is having gone, you know, left to right, then zigged up 20, left to right, zigged up 20. Um, I'm going to then switch to doing vertical passes as the same thing. So I'll do a set of horizontal passes and then I'll do a vertical pass. So let's see what this looks like in the visualizer, a universal G code sender. In UGS, you can see the serpentine back and forth, but you can also see that zigzag that you get as I pass back and forth each time. So really what I'm doing is I'm going across and then zag up, across, zag up. And once I'm done with that, once I'm in the top corner, I start going back down again. So up and down, up and down. And that'll give me a clean pass. Again, you'll notice that there's no Z axis. I'm going to handle that manually by, as I mentioned before, zeroing to the top of the board somewhere in the center, moving the Z axis down just a hair, say, you know, half a millimeter running this pass. If I like what I've got, I'm done. If I don't, I'll run another half a millimeter off the top, but I'm going to run in real thin passes to take the least possible. I used a X, Y, back and forth, up and down pattern to do the surfacing here. I could have used a concentric pattern. I could have added diagonals, any number of things. This worked really well. It generates a phenomenal amount of dust, even with the uh, dust collector working really hard. It's also something that's very sensitive to anything out of true on the cutter head itself. In metalworking, surfacing is often called fly cutting. Um, I don't know why it's not called that very often in woodworking, but the surfacing operation is fabulous. I mean, the result you get is just wonderful. MDF, which is a naturally very, very flat uh, piece of material, it, it's hard to tell because it feels so flat if there are warps in there, but as you surface, you can see where it's taking any slight warpage out of it. Or if you turned out to have created a warp by screwing it to the deck, which may have some warp. In my case, I've moved this from house to house and locations a number of times, and over the years, it's, it's not as true on the deck as I'd like. Uh, I try and keep the axes true true, but the underlying structure for the deck just doesn't have perfect flatness. So I don't worry about that because having put the spoil board on here, I recreate the warp of the deck itself, but then I plane all that away so that I know that the surface itself is now true to the axes. So um, as non-routing as that is, and, and not a super common CNC operation, it's super valuable for an awful lot of different kinds of things you might want to do where you want to achieve a really nice looking surface. So now that I have my spoil board true to the axes in the XY plane, uh, I also want to have a visual indication of how to line things up. The deck had wonderful, or still does, I guess, I just don't see it underneath the spoil board, these silk screen 10 millimeter lines that help in alignment. I wanted to recreate that here, so I'm going to engrave those lines uh, with a thin, a shallow pass of an engraving bit to create the lines that I can use to visually align pieces when I'm putting them in place. I really don't need to engrave very deeply into the wood to create the visual line. And in fact, over time, I'm likely to resurface and re-engrave the spoil board two, three, four or more times if it becomes so munged up with engraved or cut or milled or drilled holes that it's hard to use the alignment lines anymore. Um, 10 millimeters apart, it's a pretty easy pattern to run. I'm just going to run it back and forth and up and down. And I only need to go 
about three quarters of a millimeter thick or, or half a millimeter thick uh, to get a really solid good looking line. So let's look a little bit more about how I generated the path for the engraving and how I got going on that. The G code for the engraving is very similar to the G code for the surfacing. Uh, once again, I'm running a left to right, then right to left, left to right, then right to left, and a top to bottom, bottom to top pattern. And I want to do it every 10 millimeters so I have lines on the board that I can use for alignment that are true to the axes of the machine itself. Um, I'm cheating here just like I did with the engraver and using my CNC control software to set the Z level. And once it's set, I'm just going to run it back and forth across 610 millimeters is the dimensions of the 24 inch by 24 inch board, um, just slightly more. So it should run off the board and that's okay back and forth. So, you know, again, it's real simple, just what speed I'm going to run it at and back and forth and back and forth and up and down and up and down. And, you know, we can see what that looks like in UGS. After loading up the pattern that we built in the spreadsheet into Universal G-Code Center, you can see it makes a lovely grid pattern that is exactly what I'm going to want to mirror the silk screened grid on the board below. It's pretty simple. Uh, I'm not going to make it very deep. I'll be very careful to set the alignment very low because I can always go back and dig it deeper again. And over time, I may resurface the board more than once and do these over and over again over the life of the spoil board until it's just trashed and I have to get rid of it. One of the ways I screwed up when I was doing this operation was that I committed a easy uh, mistake to make, but I should have known better. That was I didn't chuck the bit tight enough into the router. And the first three or four times I tried to engrave it, it pushed the bit up every time the router went down. So I started off engraving exactly the depth I wanted, but by the time I got to the other side, it was just barely scratching the surface. And I kept thinking, oh my goodness, has something warped the table so bad that it's just out of it? And I kept trying to go deeper and deeper, but eventually I realized, no, I just been uh, uh, uncareful and not chucked it tight enough. So always make sure you chuck your bits in tight when you take an operation of any kind. All right, the engraving's done on top of the mill, uh, surfacing, uh, on top of the drilling. My three operations are complete. I now have a spoil board that's securely attached to my deck that's level and smooth in the XY plane and has a grid of lines for alignment. Uh, I can use this for months or years, depending on the number of operations. It's thick enough that I can run more surfacing, more engraving, so I can keep going down. I can go down far enough until I'm at risk of starting to hit uh, the screw heads that are countersunk in there when I'm actually over penetrating from the work material. Um, I have to have a spoil board at this point. And as soon as I trash one, the first operation I have to make is another one. Whether you use a temporary spoil board that's any piece of scrap underneath your work, or you choose to make a reusable spoil board like this, I uh, hope this has been useful. A uh, bit of a practical tip for your router-based CNC. And I, I hope you're safe, use good ventilation, and have fun.